you don't have to spend a lot to get a great tripod. You don't have to go to really right stuff and spend $1,500 on a tripod. If you do, then blessings to you. But $100 will do the job all day long. Hello, I'm Kevin Wenning. Uh, this is one of those topics that I get asked a lot about uh, just because I work with a lot of kind of newish photographers and uh, this is something that, uh, frankly, to me, when I started out, I had a lot of questions about as well. Uh, so let's dive right in. This is all about tripods, heads, support systems for your camera, and specifically through the lens of what I do most, which is travel photography. Yes, we are in my garage. I just finished up a couple of videos that I was working on for my bike tours, talking about my bike gear. So we're in my garage. Welcome. Uh, all right. So what is the big deal? When you are a travel photographer or any, anybody just getting started with your photography, you're going to hear a lot about, well, what kind of tripod do you have? Especially if you do a lot of travel, if you're getting into landscape or long exposure, a tripod is very important to you. Even if you do a lot of studio or tabletop product photography, you're going to need a tripod of some sort. So I'm going to cover for you the basic support systems, what you might use in the studio and then what you might use for travel and then how do you attach your camera, of course, to a tripod? It's simple to me now, but when I first got started, I had no idea. And what you might do, what most people do, is you go to Amazon first, type in tripods, you read the reviews, what's good, I don't know. If you have a local camera shop, frequent your local camera shop. They are great folks. They are photographers themselves almost all the time, and they'll give you great advice. However, if, if you don't have a local camera shop, that's why I'm doing this. A lot of people that go on my trips are asking what kind of a tripod should I bring with me? Or I've never used a tripod, I've only shot handheld, what should I know? Okay, so that's why we're here. Uh, so here's where I started in the studio. I'm gonna talk about tripod and then, uh, and then we'll talk about what goes on top of it, of course. This is where I started in the studio with this tripod actually. And the main reason that I liked it was it's got a center column that I can remove or that I can turn, got this facing the wrong way, or that I can turn horizontal. And that was a big deal to me because a lot of times I would be doing tabletop shots where I'm doing a, a down shot on food or a product or what have you. So the articulating arm was a big deal to me at the time. I don't usually use this one anymore. Uh, I do take this one a lot for my, uh, or I used to anyway, when I was doing a lot of shots for architecture, doing hotels, uh, doing homes for real estate agents. Uh, so this was very useful to me in those cases. However, this is not a tripod that I use all the time anymore. Uh, I'll tell you why in a second. And then I graduated to this little guy right here, actually. Not sure why my bag is on there. And I moved to this one because I was taking a trip and I wanted something that was small and light and inexpensive. I didn't really know what I should take when I tra traveled, so I just got something small and inexpensive. This was right at $100. This is a Surui tripod. They make pretty good stuff. There's a few problems with them. They're better, they're worse. But for better or worse, this is where I started at 100 bucks. You don't need to break the bank if you're just getting a tripod. So start with something small and light. And then after a couple of years of that, I said, I need the big stuff. I want a nice heavy duty tripod that's tall. So I got this one, also a Sarui. I was pretty happy with them. The main difference that you'll see here between these two, I don't know why I put that one out of the way course the height. Uh, this one weighs uh, about a pound more than the little guy which makes a little bit of a difference depending on you know, where you're traveling, uh, airline weight restrictions. To me the main reason that I take this it's a little more solid, it's just a little bit heavier, got a bigger footprint, wider base if you will, and then you'll notice of course, of course the height whenever I've got my camera on the short one I've got to duck down if I want to look in the viewfinder. Now a lot of cameras now most have a really great screen on the back and articulating even so I don't necessarily have to duck down but I like to compose through the viewfinder a lot so I find myself squatting down to, to looking through my camera. Uh, so I got the big tripod because hello I don't have to squat down I can set it to my eye level you know I can set it to my eye level and then I don't have to squat down plus it's a little bit taller than me so even if I'm on a grade and I have to set my tripod down below me in a stream bed or on the mountain or off of a rock, uh, I can do that pretty easily and still have it tall enough to, to look through the viewfinder. So that's the primary reason that I got the slightly larger uh, tripod. 
the, the type of uh, support system, as far as the legs is what I mean, is uh, something that's going to be important to you, as well as the collapsed size. So we talked about the overall height. Now the collapsed size is also important to me. So let's do that real quick. If I take the little guy, I collapse it all the way up. All right, pretty small. And then I can flip the legs around and put them the other direction as well. Come on. And the, uh, the thing that I still like about this one, and I take this one on a lot of my travels, I used the big guy for years, and now I use this one when I want to go somewhere on a short trip because this can fit in a backpack. And if you don't want to be conspicuous, you don't want people to think you're a photographer, you can actually slip this right in a backpack and it'll disappear. But it'll get you through in almost all cases. Uh, there's really no reason you need a, a giant tripod. A little jobby will do for you in most cases. So, benefit to the, for the little guy. Of course, benefits for the big guy, tall. That's kind of about it. And the more expensive you go on tripods, of course, this one's carbon fiber. It's so pretty. I, I don't know that that really matters. It is a little less cold if I'm in a cold climate than the aluminum one, which is 100 bucks. So I don't know, that kind of matters, I guess. If it matters to you, I don't know why exactly. But <clears throat> the other thing that you'll get on a larger tripod is do, 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 screw out feet with I don't know what you call these spikes on the feet, which are nice if you're in a terrain where, of course, it's soft in mud, uh, so you can get some traction. Whereas that tripod, if it's really windy, it might shift if you get a big gust of wind. Uh, having those spikes on the feet, there's a little bit of benefit to that, of course. Okay. Then, um, the thing that I don't like about this tripod, and the reason I don't travel with it, is you'll notice these guys have twist locks on the legs. Uh, some, tri some tripods, <laughs> some photographers don't like these because it is very easy to forget to lock down one of these legs and then while you're in the middle of shooting, your tripod goes, ooh, because the leg isn't locked. <clears throat> now you don't want to be doing that on the edge of a cliff and uh, I know some photographers who have lost their cameras because their tripod legs weren't locked. Now that to me is human error, that's something I can overcome, lock my tripod legs. With this guy, this has flip locks on the legs, which is a little quicker up and down. Okay, that's kind of nice. However, it's got, and you can't really see this in the video, but it's got screws and bolts on the flip locks to keep them on the legs. And this is a really expensive, really nice tripod. I like it for studio, but if I'm out all day and I'm traveling to different locations, setting my tripod up, taking it up and down, up and down, up and down, I'm flipping the locks, that's gonna loosen up this bolt and nut here. And unless I've got tools with me, it's gonna get so loose to the point that I can't tighten it anymore. And as a travel photographer, I don't wanna take more gear than I have to. So no thanks, I'm gonna take just the tools that I need to get the job done for me. So that's the reason I don't travel a whole lot with this guy. Another note, I guess, since we're on it, on tripods, if you do raise the column and you get one with a tall column, this makes it a little bit more unsteady because it can wiggle while you've got your camera on the top. Uh, some people like to have no center column and they mount their, the, the head is literally on top of the legs and that makes it a little bit more solid. Okay, if you're going into really windy conditions, then maybe that matters to you. To me, uh, mounting it just on the column does the job for me. Uh, something else that's useful, I guess, is having this little hook on the bottom. So if you've got a fully weighted camera bag, you've got your extra lenses and stuff in here. Just put your, put your bag on the hook and that will weight your tripod, making it stay in one place, which to me also takes care of the fact that I might have a slightly wobbly center column. Takes the weight and yeah, just makes it more solid. Huh. All right, pretty simple. So yeah, that's, that's everything you need to know about tripods. Next thing you wanna know is how do I attach my camera onto the top of this tripod? Do I actually have to screw the thing on? Uh, they do come with screw holes on the bottom, uh, almost all of them with a three-eighths, or sorry, quarter-inch screw hole, some with a three-eighths inch screw hole, and it's easy to get the adapters. Amazon is great for that. You can find adapters of all sorts for different ball heads. Again, I started out cheap with the tight, tiny little ball head, 
and this is just going to screw right onto the top of your top of your column right there. And now you've got to figure out, okay, what kind of plate mounting system am I going to use? And this one uses a uses a what we call Arca Swiss style. There's all different styles. Manfrotto's got their own. Uh, Arca Swiss is a pretty universal standard. You're going to have a pretty easy time finding that anywhere. Uh, so I've got mounted on the bottom of my camera this little clip that fits into the Arca Swiss uh, style ball head. And you'll also see that I've got mounted on here on the side and on the bottom an L plate. What's the point of an L plate? Well, if I've got my camera mounted like this and I want to instead shoot portrait style, I don't have to turn the ball head and figure out how to get it down here. I just take my camera out of the plate, reposition it up here, and I'm good to go. So that's the point of having an L plate on there. Makes recomposing really easy and you don't actually have to recompose whereas you, you know, if you got your camera over here, you're going to have to move your tripod back and maybe your camera up a little bit. Not so much if you're doing landscapes, but if you're doing architecture, just that little bit of movement can change the whole scene quite drastically. So I started with this tiny little ball head. It did the job for really light lenses, and it's still nice to have in my bag in case I need to travel really light, small and light. However, I graduated to this guy, which was $650 US, I think, and it's from uh, Really Right Stuff. It's, uh, it's very solid. It's got a really big handle for cranking down the head. Uh, it's got a giant ball in here, which when I crank it down, I can put as large a lens as I want on here. And the head is not the problem at that point. If I've got a giant lens on the front of my tripod, of course the stability here is the problem. So I really need to weight it down. Uh, so big ball head, better for big lenses and more weight. Uh, this, the disadvantage to this of course is it's heavier. If you're traveling with a large ball head, you're going to pay the, maybe you have to pay airline fees and you're going to pay the difference in your back. If you're a backpacker carrying this in, uh, this one weighs about five times the, you know, what the, what the little guy does. Uh, the other big advantage though to this type of head, and you don't have to get as large a head as I did, but you've got a quick release on here. So if I want to get my camera out quickly, real easy to take it in and out. If you've got something like this, which a lot of photographers are, are happy with, again, because of the weight savings, but you're going to have to crank this down in order to get your camera tightened and loosen it up to get it out. Just not a quick release. Uh, not a big deal to me. I like the quick release. Um, L plate. I have this sitting here just because, you know, it's an L plate. I wanted to show you an L plate. Why not? Uh, now, the other types of heads that I have, these are very specific for different purposes. You've got your big video head. Uh, not going to travel with this one. Uh, you'll, you'll see you know, videographers travel with this type of head because it does slow pans. Obviously, I haven't even used this in a while. I've got it all locked up here. Uh, it's going to do your slow pans to the side. It's going to do your slow pan up and down. Uh, again, I rarely use this one, but I keep it because I've had it forever and I can't see any sense in getting, getting rid of it. I use it occasionally. Uh, this one uses a specific Manfrotto style plate that I have to put in there. Uh, it does also fit Arca Swiss, but I have to rig it in there. So this guy just kind of lives in my closet. I pull it out when I need it. That's not a, a common head that most people are going to purchase. Uh, this is a head that I see a lot of photographers really enjoy working with. Uh, again, it's very heavy. It's even heavier than my large ball head. The purpose for this guy, and the reason that I got it, was for doing architecture. And with architecture, you want to be very specific. You don't want keystoning in your frames. So if your camera's pointing up just a little bit, you're going to get that keystoning where the it's doing what my hands do, <laughs> where you see the lines in the room, like the corners of the room starting to go out. That means that your wide angle lens is starting to distort the room. Uh, so the purpose for this, and I don't have the plate on my camera for this, uh, is you can just make teeny tiny little movements using the adjustment knobs so you can turn it just a little bit at a time and that helps you get your framing exactly where you want it. So it's great for, uh, great for architecture, which is what I, I use it the most for. Uh, so that's the point of that particular lens, lens, <laughs> that particular head. Uh, it does take a proprietary plate, which I don't have up here 
I'll have to post a picture of it in the video. So that's the, the only real disadvantage to using different brands or different proprietary plates is I would have to take off what's on the bottom of my camera now in order to put a plate on here that would fit, that would fit this head. So when I was doing a lot of architecture photography, I had one camera dedicated just for this head and this travel camera basically lived at home. Uh, so slight disadvantage there. Plus, again, I think I said this is very heavy. Uh, it's not all that expensive. This is far cheaper than something like this. I wanna say this was like $200 and this is 650 US, so big difference there. But of course, this is not something you're going to want to travel with. Now I'll give you one last little thing that I find very handy for me, especially as a travel photographer, is something called quick uh, capture clips is what they, this one is called. Peak Design makes this one, goes on your belt, and then you've got a little uh, proprietary clip that goes on the bottom of your camera. When you need to grab your camera, it's sitting right here on your belt, and you just pull it out. Uh, it's very handy in cases where you're doing a lot of street photography and you don't want to be conspicuous. I'll put my camera on a camera clip, and I hide it here, I put my jacket over it, so when I'm walking down the street, people don't look at me and walk the other way because they think, oh, he wants to take my photo. So I try and keep it hidden until I've walked up to somebody, had a conversation with them, and they say, yeah, sure, of course you can take my photo. Then I take out my camera and I say, okay, we're ready to go. I don't want to advertise that I'm a photographer. I certainly don't want to look like a tourist with a swinging camera around my neck. I'm being a little ridiculous about that, but you get the point. It's nice and uh, convenient, plus it keeps your camera out of sight if that's the type of thing that you want. So to wrap up, my general advice here is go with something that suits your shooting style. If you're doing something that's primarily studio and you don't need it to be small and light, get something heavy, get something bulky that's easy to work with, that you don't have to worry about, you know, is it quick to pack up? Uh, it's just gonna be there when you need it. You can set it over in the corner. You don't care if it's taking up space. You'll get something solid if you're doing a lot of studio photography. If you're doing some, if you're doing some travel photography, then you want to consider how small does it pack up? How heavy is it? Uh, what kind of things am I going to be shooting when I'm doing my travel photography? Uh, this guy is just a little bit too large to fit in my backpack. I have to put it on the outside. I can't travel without somebody seeing this and spotting me and, and identifying me as a photographer, which I don't frankly like. I, I usually like to be inconspicuous. Uh, and then the small guy, I almost got rid of this one just because I thought, well, it's cheap. It wasn't a you know, really great tripod in the first place. No, it is. It's, you don't have to spend a lot to get a great tripod. You don't have to go to really right stuff and spend $1,500 on a tripod. If you do, then blessings to you. But $100 will do the job all day long. Same goes for your ball heads. You can get in and get started for $100. This was, again, I think $120 actually for this ball head. So $220 all in for a good tripod and a good ball head to get you started. And then if you decide you need to graduate up, then you know get something a little bit bigger. This one, frankly, is a little bit too big. I should have gotten something just a size down from this that's a little bit lighter, still does the job just as well. Uh, I decided I was just going to go nuts. Obviously, you don't need to spend that kind of money or have that kind of heft unless you're toting giant lenses and doing uh, wildlife photography all the time. So that's it as far as my tripods, ball heads, and support systems go. I uh, hope this has been useful. As always, leave me comments and questions. I'm happy to help anybody. Thanks so much. Be well. <laughs>